In this video, we're going to talk about the characteristic equation and the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. To talk about these, we need to spend a little bit of time talking about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We will look at some examples. We will talk a little bit about the history. And when we discuss the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, we will provide a non-proof so that we can see things that we can't do in trying to prove a, a theorem about matrices. And then we will talk about an outline of one particular proof uh, of the many possible proofs of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. So let's recall what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are all about. The idea is we are trying to solve a square system, a matrix equation, a matrix A times a vector X, and we're looking for the situation when that result is a constant lambda times the same vector x. There are lots and lots of applications of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We are focusing on the basic idea in solving a system like this. And so one solution for this system is to uh, just let x be the zero vector. And so on the left, we have the matrix times the zero vector. On the right hand side, we have the zero vector. And that's true for any lambda, that the zero vector is equal to the zero vector. So in this scenario, we focus on non-trivial vector solutions. We are looking for situations in which this system has a solution, a vector that is not the zero vector. So we can subtract uh, AX from both sides. It's a, uh, a matrix times a vector. Subtract that from both sides. And we get lambda X minus the AX. And that would then be equal to the zero vector. Lambda X is a vector. A times X is a vector. The subtraction would be the resulting zero vector. We can factor the x from both pieces. And in that case, we have something times x is equal to the 0 vector. The something isn't just lambda at that point, because we can't say lambda minus a matrix. So it's lambda times the identity matrix. And the i sub n is representing the fact that this is a square n by n system that we're talking about. So we need to use the identity matrix of the appropriate size. So for this to have a non-zero solution, uh, for this equation to have a non-zero solution, the matrix lambda i minus a must be a singular matrix. In other words, a matrix that is not invertible. And so for that matrix to be not invertible, uh, that means that the determinant has to be zero. And so the values of lambda that make that matrix have a determinant of zero are called the eigenvalues of A. Eigen from the German word for same. So there are then corresponding non-zero vectors that go with those particular eigenvalues. And those vectors are called the eigenvectors of A. So the lambda values that give solutions to this equation are the eigenvalues, and the corresponding vectors that we can put into that equation are the eigenvectors. So let's take a look at an example of calculating and uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a particular matrix. So we're going to look at the eigenvalues of just a two by two matrix. The idea is the same uh, with larger matrices. The steps are, are usually more time consuming. There are lots of algorithms uh, for, for focusing on this problem. Uh, so the general idea 
is we're going to look at this matrix uh, B that is, again, that lambda I minus the matrix A. So we have lambda I has lambdas on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. So when we subtract A from that, we have lambda minus 3. We have negative 1 and negative 2 on the the off diagonal, and then the other main diagonal entry is lambda minus 2. So then the determinant of B in this case is lambda minus 3 times lambda minus 2, and then we're subtracting negative 1 times negative 2. So lambda minus 3 times the quantity lambda minus 2 minus 1 times 2. Multiplying this out, we have lambda squared minus 5 lambda plus 6, then minus that 2. So we have lambda squared minus 5 lambda plus 4. And that factors as the quantity lambda minus 1 times the quantity lambda minus 4. So the two values that would make that determinant be 0 are lambda equals 1 and lambda equals 4. So those are the two eigenvalues of A. So now let's take a look at the, an eigenvector that corresponds to the eigenvalue of lambda equals 1. So we're looking at this system. We're looking at the system where that matrix B times an X. And ultimately what we're looking at is we're looking at that, that the right hand side being the zero vector. So we have this matrix uh, times the X, Y, the, the components of that vector X. So the simplification here, we have negative 2, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1, times this x, y, and that's 0, 0, uh, that vector on the right-hand side. So since these two rows are the same, this means that negative 2x minus y has to equal 0 in both situations. Uh, this is where we get the infinitely many solutions. This means that y is equal to negative 2x. And so any solution to this matrix equation has y equal to negative 2x. So if we pick an x value, there's the corresponding y value that goes with it. So if, for instance, we pick x equals 1, then the y value is negative 2. So an eigenvector for this is 1, negative 2. Turns out that any uh, constant multiple of this vector is also an eigenvector for the same system. Often we see instead of a, an eigenvector, in this case, that has integer values, we often see these normalized. Uh, so a vector that points in the same direction, uh, or maybe exactly the opposite direction, but that has length of 1. And so in this particular case, a normalized version we might write as 1 over the square root of 5 and negative 2 over the square root of 5, or rationalize those and write that, but uh, mathematically those are the same uh, concept. So a normalized version of this eigenvector that corresponds to lambda equals 1 is this vector here. Okay, now we have the other aspect as well. We want an eigenvector for that same matrix that now corresponds to the eigenvalue of 4. And in the same way, we're going to have more than one possible eigenvector, but we will look at a straightforward solution and then a normalized solution. So just as we did uh, in the previous example, we're looking at the new vector, uh, excuse me, the new matrix B. The new matrix B in this case is four on the diagonals and then subtracting A from that, zeros on the off diagonals in, in, the, in the matrix B. And so our matrix is one, negative one, and negative two, two. 
times xy, and again on the right hand side that is the zero vector. And so this means that x minus y is equal to zero, or negative 2x plus 2y is equal to zero, same thing, those two equations uh, are, are redundant. And so this means that y is equal to x. So again, pick an x value, if we pick one, then an eigenvector uh, is 1, 1. Normalized version, in this case, I rationalized, we write that as square root of 2 over 2 uh, in each component, the x and the y. Again, any multiple, any constant multiple of 1, 1 is, a, is an eigenvector that corresponds to lambda equals 4. The only one that we don't use is multiplying this by 0 because we're looking for non-trivial eigenvectors. Z zero can be an eigenvalue, but the zero vector is never an eigenvector for a system. So the characteristic polynomial of a square matrix, an n by n matrix, is this polynomial uh, in terms of lambda, and it's just the determinant of that matrix B that we described, lambda times the identity minus that matrix A. This uh, polynomial is invariant under uh, matrix similarity. Similarity uh, is a concept related to two square matrices. You have two square matrices uh, of the same size. They're similar, or sometimes they're called conjugates uh, of one another. If there exists an invertible matrix P so that one of the two matrices is equal to P inverse times A times that other matrix P. So again, we could swap the role of A and B in this, uh, but if we can multiply um, one of them on the left by the inverse, on the right by the other matrix P, uh, and get that second matrix, then these two matrices are similar. And what this corresponds to is a change of basis. So two matrices are similar if the, there's this idea of a change of basis. So since our matrix uh, characteristic equation or characteristic polynomial uh, is described in terms of that matrix lambda times the identity minus a, then the eigenvalues uh, are exactly the things that make that determinant equal to zero. And so the eigenvalues of a are the roots of the characteristic polynomial. The coefficients of that polynomial uh, at least some of them, include the determinant of A and the trace of A. Remembering that the trace of A is simply the sum of the elements along the diagonal of the matrix A. So we're going to look at this in a little more detail in the case of N equals 2. And so we're going to look at a generic 2 by 2 matrix, uh, just entries A, B, C, D. The characteristic polynomial uh, is this p of lambda is our uh, is our variable at this point. So we have that's equal to the determinant of um, again lambda times the identity minus the matrix A. And so in this case, um, lambda on the diagonals minus all of these entries, we have lambda minus A is the is the upper left hand corner negative b negative c lambda minus d. That's the matrix. We want the determinant of that matrix. And so the determinant of that matrix, lambda minus A times the quantity lambda minus D, and then subtract uh, negative B times negative C, which so we subtract B times C. Expand that, and we get lambda squared minus A plus D times lambda plus AD minus BC. Notice what A plus D is. A plus D is the trace of A, and AD minus BC is the determinant of A. So for the characteristic polynomial of a generic 2 by 2 matrix, it's lambda squared. This is a monic polynomial. The leading coefficient is 1. 
minus the trace of a times lambda, and in this case, it's plus the determinant of a. So we can calculate this polynomial, and then we're going to do things with the polynomial um, later. We're not just calculating the polynomial to calculate it. Uh, of course, there's, there are reasons for, for calc these, these calculations. If we look at the case of n equals 3, uh, we can again look at the generic um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I matrix determinant described in the same kind of way. Uh, the, the polynomial, the characteristic polynomial is defined to be this determinant. We do all of the calculation, uh, expanding in this case, in the calculation here, of uh, expanded along the top row. And so we have the top value, lambda minus a, then times the determinant of this minor, where you eliminate that first column and that first row. So that entry, lambda minus a, times this two by two matrix, uh, times the determinant of this two by two matrix in the bottom right hand corner. And then working our way across uh, this entry, when we calculate it in the determinant, becomes an opposite sign of what it was originally. And then uh, in that case, we are eliminating that first row and that middle column. And then uh, the last entry, C, and we're eliminating again the first row and the last column, and we're looking at the determinant of these pieces that are, that are left. And so expanding that out, uh, we get this uh, much more complicated uh, looking uh, characteristic polynomial just because there are more pieces. Again, notice it's a monic polynomial. Notice that the lambda squared, the second coefficient, is a plus e plus i times lambda squared, of course, with a negative coefficient in the front. So again, that's minus the trace. The lambda term, uh, we're not going to worry too much about the name of that. But if you look at the last entry over here, the last entry is, again, uh, you can check this. This is the determinant of the original matrix. So we have lambda cubed minus the trace of a times lambda squared plus something times lambda. Then this time it's minus the determinant of a rather than plus the determinant of a uh, like it was in the n equals 2 case. All right, so we can take these same ideas and expand to the general case. So the characteristic polynomial for a general n by n matrix turns out uh, to be, again, the monic polynomial, uh, lambda to the n, minus the trace times lambda to the n minus 1, plus a whole bunch of pieces in between that are based on all these calculations that, that, uh, that we've done along the way. And then it will be, a plus or minus the determinant. It will depend on whether n is even or odd, uh, whether we're adding the determinant or subtracting the determinant. The coefficients uh, in the middle pieces uh, from the uh, lambda to the n minus second power down to just the lambda, uh, those don't have specific names in terms of, of the function itself or the matrix itself, excuse me, but uh, they can be described in terms of traces of certain powers of, of the matrix that we have started with. All right, so that's the characteristic polynomial. Uh, the characteristic equation is just set all of that equal to zero. And I've written it in terms of a variable x now, rather than in terms of the specific uh, lambda that corresponds to the to the eigenvalues, we sometimes see this written in, in another variable. And in that case, then, uh, again, the coefficients are determined by the matrix. So they're not specifically parts of the matrix, uh, but they are determined by the matrix. The values of x that solve the characteristic equation are the eigenvalues, just like we've seen. 
Now, the C n minus 1 term does correspond uh, to the negative trace. The C0 term uh, it corresponds to either plus or minus the determinant. The other coefficients de depend on what uh, the specific matrix is. But again, they are in terms of, or can be written in terms of, the trace of powers of, of, the, uh, of the matrix. Okay, so now we're ready to at least state the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Uh, we're going to state it, uh, do some things with it, and then uh, outline, again, as we mentioned, a non-proof and a proof uh, of, the, of the theorem. So the Cayley-Hamilton theorem is named after an English mathematician named Arthur Cayley, who, who was um, born in 1821 and died in 1895, and an Irish mathematician, William Rowan Hamilton, who was born in 1805 and died in 1865. They knew each other. They worked on some things together. Uh, Hamilton is known for a, a lot of things, well, as is Cayley, but uh, Hamilton is the person that invented quaternions, um, which was kind of a rival idea to vectors uh, and is originally used for rotation purposes. Kind of fell out of favor for a long time, but now a lot of computer graphics uh, applications use the quaternion version to do things rather than using a matrix approach uh, for, for rotations. There are pros and cons to each. Uh, it's good to be able to switch back and forth at different times to do things in one way or do things in another way. But they knew each other. They were working on similar problems. Uh, and in this statement, or in this case, the, the theorem that has both of their names says that if we have an n by n matrix, then A, the, the, the matrix A, is a solution of its own characteristic equation. So we think of the characteristic equation in the expanded form, not in the form of the determinant, but in the expanded form, the characteristic equation uh, if we, instead of using X, if we put the matrix A in here, then we get on the right-hand side a matrix equation. So the nth power of A plus something times the n minus first power of A all the way down to something times A plus something times the identity. These somethings, the C's, are numbers, they're constants. And then on the right-hand side, we get zero, but in this case, since we have square matrices all throughout and we've added them together, we have the zero on the right-hand side in this case is the, an n by n matrix of all zeros. So again, these coefficients can be written in terms of the trace of certain powers of A. Uh, the coefficients c sub n minus 1 and c sub 0 are what you expect. The negative trace and the determinant, uh, positive or negative, depending on whether n is even or odd. And again, the 0 on the right-hand side is the n by n 0 matrix. So how can we use this theorem by the way, Cayley proved, I think, a two by two case. Um, there are there was a three by three case that was proved uh, in the 1870s. Frobenius proved the general case. Uh, our proof that we're going to consider is from the 1880s. Uh, so we will we will outline a method um, in, in just a few minutes uh, that is different than than um, the first general proof. So before we talk about the proof, we want to see a couple of ways that we can use this theorem. That this statement is that if we look at these powers of A that are added together with the specific coefficients, then we always get the zero matrix. And so in calculating powers of a matrix, multiplying matrices gets resource intensive. It takes a lot of steps. Uh, 
as matrices get bigger, then there's a lot of steps in those uh, because what we're doing again is multiplying uh, row vectors by column vectors. So there's a dot product, so all the multiplications and the additions and so on. Uh, but even if the matrix isn't very big, multiplying uh, to get a high power of the matrix is just ends up doing a lot of calculations. Uh, and so if we can save on those calculations, I mean, there are times when we need to calculate higher powers of a matrix to solve certain problems. And so if we can reduce the number of calculations, then we can improve uh, our results, our runtime, and so on. So let's say we have a really simple matrix, just one, two, three, four. And let's say we want to calculate A to the fourth power. So what would happen if we want to calculate A to the fourth power? One, two, three, four. Well, just calculating A squared in the, in the direct uh, method, the naive calculation, we would have one, two, three, four, and then multiply that by one, two, three, four. So first row, first column, there's already two multiplications and an addition. Second row, or excuse me, first row, second column, two multiplications and, addition, and, an, addi and an addition. Uh, do this each time. And so we have eight multiplications and an addition just to get a squared. Well, then we get a third, a to the third. There's eight more multiplications and another addition, a to the fourth, eight more multiplications and another addition. So what do we have? 24 multiplications and three additions. Well, if we look at the results of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, we say, okay, well, we have the, the characteristic equation has a squared minus the trace of a times a plus the determinant of a times this uh, identity matrix, and that gives us the zero vector, excuse me, the zero matrix in that case. What we can do is we can solve that for a squared, and a squared is equal to the trace of a minus the determinant, excuse me, trace of a times a minus the determinant of a times the identity. Well, in this particular case, we can calculate the trace readily, and the determinant we uh, can calculate one time. This time, it's, it's easy to calculate one times four minus two times three. But even if this were a larger matrix and we calculate the determinant one time, it takes some work to calculate it once, but then we can put that back and we'll see how useful it is because the same value is going to keep showing up. Um, we can have that determinant um, in place, calculate it one time, and, and save going forward. Okay, so what happens in this particular case? A squared is five times A plus two times the identity. And so what, ha what has happened, instead of eight multiplications and two additions, what we really have um, is five times A, so five times A is four multiplications, and we don't really need to do the multiplications of two times the identity, we just know to add two along the diagonal. So what do we have? Instead of eight multiplications and two additions, we get four multiplications and two additions. So that saves um, some calculation. Four, four multiplications are saved in this case. Well, what if we go on to a cubed? Well, a cubed is a squared times a. What do we know about a squared? a squared was right here, 5a uh, plus 2 times the identity. Multiply that by a, and so we get 5a squared plus 2a. Well, what is a squared? We can, again, put that back in, and we end up with a cubed is 27a plus 10 times the identity. So again, what do we have? 27 times a is four multiplications, and then what do we have? Two additions by adding 10 along the diagonal. So what happens? Four multiplications and two additions in the a squared calculation. For a cubed, it's four multiplications and two additions. We do work, kind of offline work. We have to do this calculation to figure out what a cubed looks like. And the formula for a cubed is specific to this matrix because the trace of A and the determinant of A were needed at the beginning. But we do those calculations one time, 
and then once they're done, the calculation for higher powers of a, a to the fourth, well, that's a cubed times a. Um, well, a cubed has a description in terms of just the a and the identity. So that reduces to an a squared again. Put the a squared in place, and what happens? a to the fourth is 145 times a plus 54 times the identity. Once again, four multiplications and two additions. So what happens? Uh, higher and higher powers. Uh, once we know the trace and once we know the determinant, we can set those back and calculate higher and higher powers of a. Uh, and everything reduces to a description in terms of a squared and a. Um, but what do we know about a squared and a? a squared and a are written in terms of a and the identity. Excuse me. Um, so all of the pieces can be stored, the trace, the determinant, and at that point calculating higher and higher powers means, yeah, we have to do some work um, on our own to get to that point, but then the computer calculation can be much, much quicker. All right, so again, we can describe this uh, even computationally with uh, kind of this recursive sense um, getting back to uh, to the calculation. But uh, but ultimately, this higher and higher powers um, is, a, is a nice application of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. So let's say we want to calculate the inverse of a matrix. So let's take the same matrix, one, two, three, four, and we want to calculate a inverse. So what do we remember? We remember that the uh, determinant is four minus six, which is negative two. It's not zero. There is an inverse. Since a squared, uh, from what we just saw, is five times a plus two times the identity, we can solve that for two times the identity, uh, subtract 5a from both sides. And we can divide by that coefficient of 2. That's just a number. So the identity matrix is a half times the quantity a squared minus 5a. We can factor um, an a from the calculation on the right-hand side. As long as we factor it to the right, we uh, get the same uh, result. And so we can factor that to the right and then multiply on the right-hand side of, of both uh, parts, right? Multiply on the right uh, by A inverse. We multiply on the right-hand side of the left-hand side of the equation. Uh, the identity times A inverse, well, that's just A inverse. So what happens? We have A inverse is equal to this piece uh, a half times the quantity a minus five times the identity. And then we have a times a inverse. A times a inverse is the identity. And so we've calculated a inverse. Now, for a two by two, we have a different formula for that. We could calculate that uh, more readily. But the idea is this is equivalent. And if we had a bigger matrix, we can go through a similar set of steps and calculate the inverse of a bigger matrix as well. All right, so now let's take a look at how not to prove the theorem. What if we just substitute A into the determinant version of the characteristic equation? So the characteristic equation in terms of the determinant uh, is P of x is the determinant of x times the identity um, minus a uh, equals 0. If we just substitute that in, uh, it would say the determinant of a times the identity minus a, which would be the determinant of the matrix a minus a, is the determinant of the 0 matrix. And that's 0, so everything is good, right? Well. There's something wrong here. 
Let's think about what that might be. In the equation up here, we're looking at the determinant of this matrix. A number times an identity minus the matrix. Determinant of a matrix, notice that this on the right hand side is the number zero. What does the Cayley-Hamilton theorem say is on the right hand side? The Cayley-Hamilton theorem says in the characteristic equation that we're using for that, we have this matrix expansion. So we have a matrix on the left hand side, pieces that are added together to other matrices, uh, multiplying by various values. But what's on the right hand side? What's on the right hand side is not the number zero. What's on the right hand side is the matrix zero. And so we can't just substitute this into the characteristic equation because that doesn't say what the Cayley-Hamilton theorem says. The Cayley-Hamilton theorem says if you look at this other version of this equation and think about it, then use in place of the x, use the matrix, then you will get the zero matrix on the right hand side. So let's look at the one of many uh, ways to prove the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. So there are several ways. Uh, we could look at an elementary approach. An elementary approach says for a given n, let's do all of this work on a generic matrix like we did in the n equals 2, n equals 3 cases for the uh, characteristic polynomial. Uh, let's do this uh, for a generic matrix and show that it always results in the zero matrix. For any specific n, uh, you have these tedious calculations. Um, and the thing about those calculations is they don't extend so easily to larger n. Even if you've solved it for one particular n, you can't readily carry that over to, to a larger value of n. Um, and even if you could, uh, using induction, uh, it would be this kind of non-illuminating solution. It wouldn't really tell you why anything is true. Uh, it would just say, OK, the calculations work out, which tell you that it is true. Uh, but, but proofs that tell why something is true uh, are, are really nice to have. We don't always have those. We can't always have those. Uh, there are some situations that um, uh, maybe we uh, maybe it's a little quick to say we can't have them, but there are lots of situations that we don't have those kinds of proofs. We have proofs of things that are computational that tell us things that that we know then must be true, uh, but really fully understanding why they're true is uh, um, is sometimes not been achieved yet. If we have a choice between a theorem that tells us that something is true and a proof that tells us why something is true, right? If the one proof says, yeah, it's true, and the other proof says, yeah, it's true, and here's why, um, we prefer the and here's why version generally. All right, so uh, rather than just kind of the straightforward elementary approach, I guess some, the, the algebraic approach that we're going to look at is still elementary in the sense that it doesn't require a lot of high-powered extra tools. It's basically based on the uh, terms we've already defined. There's not uh, new techniques involved, um, but just uh, matrices, polynomials, determinants. And then what we're going to do, uh, there's a little bit of magic in the sense that we're going to define a new kind of matrix uh, that we probably would never have thought of on our own. There are other algebraic uh, approaches that use more powerful uh, techniques from, from abstract algebra, uh, things that use uh, methods from complex variables, a lot of different approaches. We're not going to talk about those. Uh, our approach that we use will only use the pieces that, we've, that we have at least comfort with now uh, based on, on what we've talked about so far. All right, so we're going to define something called the adjugate. Sometimes uh, this is called the adjoint, uh, but there's uh, mul there are multiple things called that, and so we'll use uh, this term. So again, we have an n by n matrix A, 
and uh, the cofactor matrix uh, of A is the matrix of all the signed determinants of minors of A. So we'll give an example in just a minute uh, to see what this cofactor matrix looks like for a particular uh, example. Then uh, the adjugate of A is the transpose of the cofactor matrix. So we're going to look at the matrix of signed determinants uh, expanding in all the different possible ways that we can uh, that we can 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 look at that matrix uh, and then transpose that. And then it turns out that we get some nice results uh, from this. Uh, a times the adjugate of A, these are these commute, so we can do the adjugate of A times A, get the same answer. And it turns out that that is equal to the determinant of A times the identity. So this gives us an alternate way, it's a extra work, uh, but it gives us an, an alternate way to calculate a determinant. Uh, we, it's not really an alternate way, it really just combines the pieces. Uh, anyway, so uh, this particular tool for us is more of a theoretical purpose than it is for something that we would generally use uh, in, in real life, but it gives us a proof or a way to prove the Cayley-Hamilton theorem uh, which then is useful for us to do other things with. All right, uh, if A is invertible, then um, A times the adjugate of A being equal to the determinant um, says that I could multiply the second version by A inverse on the right-hand side. And so um, the adjugate of A also gives us a way to determine the inverse of the matrix A. Because the inverse would be one over the determinant of A times the adjugate of A. Okay, again, this is mostly theoretical uh, tool of actually calculating an inverse in this way, um, Calculating an inverse generally uh, is is not done in solving real problems, but it is useful for for proving theorems that give us tools that we then can use uh, uh, in practice with large matrices. Okay, so let's look at an example uh, with the adjugate, um, and let's just look at a, at a three by three matrix. Two by two is a little too small to really see the benefit. Um, but we have this three by three matrix. All right, so the adjugate uh, kind of skipped over the cofactor part. We're going to look at each possible um, each possible piece. So if we were looking at the first row, first column, the removing the first row in the first column gives us the minor 2, 1, 8, 9. And so what goes into the adjugate in that entry is the determinant of that, uh, of that minor. If we go to the second entry, uh, we're removing the first row again, now second column, because it's the transpose, this one is going to go down that first column. So what's the, uh, what's the, determinant that we're looking at, we're looking at the determinant of negative three, one, seven, nine. Look at the third entry. That's this minor negative three, two, uh, seven, eight. And so that's the first column. In the cofactor matrix, that would be the first row. It corresponds to exactly uh, which piece you were uh, expanding along. All right, uh, we go to the negative three. So what do we have left? We have two, three, eight, nine. Um, that goes here. Uh, the signs, by the way, are the signs in the typical cofactor expansion, plus, minus, plus, minus uh, along the way. All right, and so all of these entries, you can check each one of them. Uh, one, three, negative three, one came from removing second column and the third row. And so that's where this entry uh, is located here. All right, and so we get this matrix on the right-hand side if we do all those determinant calculations with the appropriate signs. All right, so what do we get? Um, 
we multiply A and the adjugate of A, we get an identity matrix, except it's not an identity, identity matrix. It has negative 36 multiplied along the, the diagonal. And you can check that the determinant of A actually is negative 36. So what is that? A times the adjugate of A is the determinant of A times the identity matrix. If we do the calculation with the inverse, um, then the inverse of A um, says is this. Using those pieces, we calculated the adjugate of uh, dividing uh, appropriately, and what do we have? Uh, we've calculated the inverse. So for the three by three, um, that's a straightforward steps uh, that we can do to calculate the determinant. Uh, uh, we calculate the determinant, excuse me, along the way, and then we use that uh, to calculate the inverse of the matrix. So now let's go back to the Cayley-Hamilton theorem uh, and use the adjugate to provide a, an algebraic proof for the theorem. So first we're going to define B uh, to be the adjugate of X times the identity minus A. We defined B in a different way earlier, uh, but now we're going to redefine to be to be this. And so if we multiply X times the identity minus A times the adjugate, we get the determinant of that matrix times the identity from the uh, properties that we mentioned earlier. And that determinant is just the characteristic polynomial of A in terms of X times the identity matrix. Okay, so B using the uh, idea that we've seen from the characteristic polynomial can be written out in terms of uh, X times, well, X to a power times a matrix D, X to the smaller power, smaller power, smaller power, each of these being multiplied by some uh, matrix D. Uh, and so these matrices don't depend on the X, uh, but that characteristic polynomial, B is a matrix, has a characteristic polynomial, we can write it out in some, some version. Uh, we will look at what the pieces are uh, uh, based on some things that we know and doing some matching uh, in just a couple of minutes. And so uh, that's B that we can look at. The right hand side up here is a polynomial that we've already seen, so we know how to write that out. And so what we're going to do is we are going to look at this polynomial and uh, write the left-hand side, write the right-hand side, and do some uh, simplification on that so that we can determine what the appropriate uh, pieces are, uh, and, um, and then simplify those based on some things that we will see uh, as, we, as we do a couple of simplifying steps. So with those simplifying steps, we have that the left-hand side uh, X times the identity minus A times the adjugate is this matrix again times that expanded version. Expanding this all the way out, we are distributing the X times the identity. So to here, we get powers of X multiplied by those matrices D and minus one down to the D sub zero. And then we're subtracting A times things. Uh, the X's are numbers, so we can pull those to the front. So we have X to powers times A times A, um, another matrix all the way down uh, to the end, this matrix A times whatever the last D sub zero. Now notice again that all of these are matrices of the same size. 
And so this is a matrix equation. The left-hand side is a matrix. We don't know what the X pieces are. We, we're not uh, calculating those just yet. But the right-hand side, since it is the um, characteristic polynomial of A, written in terms of X, times the identity, we have X to the N uh, times the identity, everything times the identity all the way down. Uh, C sub N minus 1, we know that that is the, is the negative trace. All those other pieces in between, over here, the C sub 0 uh, is in terms of the determinant, plus or minus. But this is a polynomial at the top. This is a polynomial uh, here. And they're equal to each other. So we're going to look at the x to the n term, say, on the right-hand side. That's here. And the x to the n term on the left-hand side, the x to the n minus 1 term on the right-hand side, the x to the n minus 1 term on the left-hand side, and keep doing this uh, throughout uh, so we can learn some more. So what we have then is this equation uh, with the left-hand side of the big equation on the top, the right-hand side uh, down below. And we're going to start matching up the pieces. On the left-hand side, that's the top part here, the part that is corresponds to the x to the nth power term. There's only one piece. And its coefficient uh, is this matrix uh, d sub n minus 1. And on the right-hand side, uh, the x to the n corresponds, uh, is corresponding coefficient if you will, is this identity matrix. So since the x's correspond to numbers uh, and these are corresponding to particular positions, the, we have that what is on the left-hand side that's multiplied by x to the n is going to match with what's on the right-hand side multiplied by the x to the n. So the d sub n minus 1 is the identity matrix. Now if we look at the uh, the n, the x to the n minus 1 power, on the left-hand side, it shows up here with this d sub n minus 2, but then there's also a, another piece over here that is minus x to the n minus 1 times a d sub n minus 1. So the x to the n minus first power on the left-hand side has these two components, but on the right-hand side, we just have this c sub n minus 1 times the identity. And so left-hand side, d sub n minus 2, that's here, minus a d sub n minus 1, that's this one. And on the right-hand side, we have this coefficient c sub n minus 1 times the identity matrix. And so those two terms have to match. Now, there's a bunch of terms in between, and so we're going to skip over those. And then we get down to the x term. So the x term on the left-hand side, uh, we have this d sub 0, and then minus a d sub 1. And on the right-hand side, the x term is a c1 times the identity. Then we look at, in terms of x, what would be the constant term? But again, this is a matrix times a matrix. Uh, on the left-hand side, negative a times d uh, sub 0. And on the right-hand side, that's this number c0 times the identity. And so we have this set of equalities uh, that tell us what these values happen to be. Now, again, we don't know what the actual values are because we don't know what the coefficients are, we know some of them. We know c sub n minus 1. Since this comes from the characteristic polynomial, uh, we, can, we know that's involved with a trace. Uh, we know that c sub 0 uh, is plus or minus the determinant, depending on, on whether n is even or odd. 
But the other pieces, we don't know exactly what they are right now, but we do know how they relate then to the, the A's, or to, to A, the original matrix A, and the D's that are on the left-hand side that would be used uh, in this expansion of the adjugate. Now, what we're going to do is we're then going to add, uh, well, we're going to do another step first. We're going to multiply each of these equations by something. Um, so this first equation, if I, as long as I multiply both sides of it by the same thing, it is still an equality. If I multiply the second equation, um, both sides by a new same thing, then it's still equal and so on. And so what we're going to multiply them by uh, are decreasing powers of the original matrix A. So we're going to look at uh, the first one here that involves D sub N minus 1. We're going to multiply both sides of it by A to the nth power. Then the next equation down, we're going to multiply everything on both sides by A to the N minus first power. And then all the way down until we get to the one with D sub 0, we're going to multiply that one uh, by... Uh, a on both sides, and the last one we will just multiply on both sides by the identity. So it won't affect the right-hand side, it won't affect the left-hand side, uh, that will still stay, um, stay as it is. All right, so what happens when we then do that? We have this a to the n d sub n minus 1 equals a to the n. We have uh, a to the n minus 1 power uh, times this matrix d sub n minus 2, but minus, and then that a sub n minus 1 times a is another a to the n power times d sub n minus 1. On the right-hand side would be c sub n minus 1 times a sub n minus 1. You'll want to write down these steps, at least for the first few, so you can see what's happening on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, basically all we're doing is replacing the i sub n's, uh, these identity matrices, with decreasing powers of, uh, of a until you get down to the last one, and then uh, it's still the identity matrix at that step. But what we're going to then do is we're going to have with this first equation we have, the second equation, the third equation, the fourth equation, and so on. We're just going to add up the left-hand side of all of those and add up the right-hand side of all of those. And since these pieces were equivalent to begin with, then the whole this new equation that we have, uh, the left-hand sides um, all added together will be equal to the right-hand sides all added together. But let's see what happens to the left-hand side. The left-hand side, we had this a to the nth power times d sub n minus 1. The second part here has an a to the n minus first power times this d n minus 2, but then we're subtracting a to the nth d sub n minus 1. So the term from the first equation and this negative term from the second equation are going to cancel each other out to be the zero matrix. The same thing is going to happen with the next two equations. The a sub n minus 1, d sub n minus 2 is going to cancel out with the next entry, and that's going to keep happening all the way down. So a times d sub 0 minus the a times d sub 0 here, those are going to, to turn into the zero matrix. The a of uh, squared d sub 1 has already canceled with the one uh, that was in the row above it. So what happens to the entire left-hand side? The entire left-hand side vanishes. It turns into the zero matrix. On the right-hand side, we have a sub n plus c sub n minus 1 times a to the n minus first power. Uh, so a to the nth here, c sub n minus 1 times a to the n minus 1, c sub n minus 2 plus a to the n minus 2, all the way down, all the way down. On the right-hand side, we see that we have the characteristic equation of the matrix A evaluated uh, with the matrix A in place, right? So what do we get? We get the right-hand side is the characteristic function evaluated at A. On the other side, we get the zero matrix. 
You want to confirm uh, that the left-hand side really does become the zero matrix. You want to confirm that the right-hand side really is what we want it to be. But what do we have? We have the equation from the Cayley-Hamilton theorem using the adjugate, using a little bit of magic along the way here. Why did we define the adjugate at all? Uh, why did we multiply by these particular pieces? Well, we can look at it from one approach and says, well, we defined the adjugate because it gave us the tools that we needed. Why did we multiply by these particular pieces? Because we were trying to get the right-hand side to look a specific way. So to get the right-hand side to look the way we want it to look, uh, we will need to multiply both sides by the pieces we need. The nice thing is when we do that, the left-hand side goes away just like we hoped it would do. It becomes the zero matrix. All right, so this algebraic approach with the adjugate is, uh, is, is a nice approach. It explains a lot. There are lots of references for various proofs uh, of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem that, that don't uh, use the adjugate. There are uh, some that use this uh, same idea, but in a more abstract setting. Uh, and there are some that use very, very different approaches. As I mentioned before, the approach that we used here uh, is credited to, to Arthur Buckheim. Um, lived in, was an English mathematician, uh, lived from 1859 to 1888. I believe this proof was from about 1883 or 1884. Um, uh, more information about, about him uh, and related proofs uh, can be found uh, at this particular uh, link. Uh, and actually, a good starting point for, for, for more work uh, is the Wikipedia entry for the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. There's a, there's a lot of nice uh, and correct uh, uh, information there and, and a lot of links to some, some nice um, uh, further reading if you want to go further with the ideas of, of Cayley-Hamilton or see uh, some of those other proofs. If you've taken courses in algebra, courses in complex uh, variables, uh, you can see what some of these analytic proofs look like uh, for complex variables or the um, the abstract algebra sense uh, to see what the, the kind of the general setting uh, for this theorem is. And as usual, feel free to ask questions in the comments uh, by email or on Discord. Thanks so much for watching.